Thank you. So we're going to go from sunny Berkshire to hot and humid Republic of Congo. So um, uh, I'm a field archaeologist from the UK, but I now work for an international consultancy. We do work all around the world, and uh, part of our work involves uh, projects working for, in this instance, a mining company, a uh, South African mining company working in uh, Republic of Congo. And I'm the archaeologist, the cultural heritage expert that undertakes the environmental and social impact assessment, the cultural heritage element um, that supports the mining company's uh, project. They're licensed to operate from the government of Congo in this instance. They can't build their mine without that environmental um, and social impact assessment and the permit that comes, comes with it. So that's my my day-to-day -day job. So I work now not in the UK a lot, but I work um, overseas quite a lot. Um, so where, where is this project? So for those of you that may be familiar with Africa, those of you that aren't, uh, Congo, there are two Congos. There's DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the big one, to the uh, east of the smaller Congo, which is Republic of Congo. And um, my project, is I can't hold it here. Is in this part of uh, Congo uh, near the border with um, Gabon. Um, the uh, the location is pretty remote. It's uh, this part of Congo um, is in um, uh, the second largest rainforest in the world after the Amazon. Uh, so it's predominantly forested. I had another side. Uh, to show you, which is basically just the, uh, the view out of the aeroplane that we flew up, um, just showing you green, it's just pointless for the coming up there, to be honest. Um, to give you an idea of, uh, of, of geography, uh, in terms of distance, uh, our project area is up here. The, the, the nearest major town, um, Point Noir, is on the coast here. That takes approximately 12 to 18 hours to drive uh, between uh, one and the other. Very, very bad roads, apart from when you get into Point Noir, where there's about one kilometre of, uh, of tarmac road. So that's where, I, that's where I am. Okay, so uh, what are we doing? Uh, we're working in a, uh, uh, a substantial area. Uh, that 220 square kilometre area is the licence area that the mining company have got from the from government of Congo to investigate where uh, the resource is. This is iron. They're looking for iron. Um, and we're investigating this area. That basically constitutes our study area. Um, and within that area, there are nine small villages. I mean, we're talking um, 200 people maximum in each, in each village. And they're spread out along a spinal road, the road that I would have traveled up from, from, from Point Noir. Um, the survey team involved archeologists from the UK. I was one of them. Uh, two of us from the UK, and then three colleagues from Central African Republic. Uh, I've worked with them uh, num a number of projects. <coughs> a number of African countries don't have capacity, don't have any archaeologists in country, don't have any archaeological or cultural heritage protection in country. Um, and so it's quite difficult and quite challenging to identify uh, people to work with, where, where we can work with them, we work with, with locals. Where we can't, we bring in people from as close to the uh, place where we're going to be working as possible. So, Central African Republic is a neighbouring country to Republic of Congo, and uh, usefully they speak uh, uh, the same. Well, it's it's a different language, but it's they can they can understand each other. It's a bit like I suppose Scottish and Welsh. <laughs> sort of. I don't know. Uh, careful, careful. Okay. Um, <laughs> The two, the two key areas of study um, that we did, uh, community interviews. So going into the community, hey, what, what's your cultural heritage? So um, the work that I would have done in the UK, field archaeology, forget all that. It's all kind of, it's living cultural heritage. So these people are practicing their cultural heritage. Um, that might involve, um, you know, Christian worship and goes to church and all that kind of stuff. But uh, more often than not, it doesn't involve any of that. It involves... Um, in this particular instance, uh, the, their, their, their gods were the, were, were, the, were the forest, were the trees, were, um, they had strange uh, belief systems, um, initiation ceremonies, sacred places, and traditions. Um, and we're documenting all that because it's important that this mining company 
from South Africa doesn't just go and obliterate the landscape. You might see some photographs on the, on the following slides that show some of that, but uh, believe me, it, it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, the other element is an archaeological survey, typical kind of uh, walking the footprint here, we're densely forested, so what we're walking across is the areas that have been either recently cleared or areas where we can basically see, see the ground and we're collecting artifacts and we're, we're mapping those. I need to move on, don't I, because I'm just... Right, interview. So here we are. This is my uh, colleague, my own colleague. I, I'm, I'm a godfather of, his, of one of his children. This guy on the right here is uh, Alfred Nanga. He's um, from the University of Bangui in Central African Republic. And he's interviewing the guy in the orange Gu Guantanamo Bay jumpsuit kind of thing. Uh, is uh, the chief of uh, uh, one of those small nine, nine villages. And the guy in the background making sure everything's being uh, understood, his, his assistant. Um, the chief, uh, is, he's got his day job, you know, he's kind of, he's a farmer, he does his thing. And we're, we're trying to understand about his, uh, his, his heritage, the heritage of the, of, of the area. Here's some more, more pretty pictures to show some of the other conversations that we're having um, in the village. So we're understanding kind of how, how, how you live. As we're having these conversations, Alfred's kind of given me a... That's, they're talking about iron, they're talking about, they're talking about metalworking, and it's like, but they don't, but it's in their ancestry, it's in their, it's in their, it's in their past. It's not what they do now, but they keep talking about it. Okay, so we start exploring this, okay, we start asking questions. So, um, uh, words that they were giving Alfred in the language, the local language, which is Enzebi, um, were referring back to their kind of metallurgical past. Um, they understood that their ancestors were metal workers um, and they had, they had the knowledge of how metal was made through the language and the way in which the, the traditions of their past have been passed down to, to, from one generation to the other. Nothing's written, no, there's no written uh, history, it's all oral. Um, but they knew certain uh, terminology. So they knew where the name of the the hill where the iron was dug was called Lekumu, and we know where that is, we, we know where that is. Um, but they had uh, words for different components of, of, of collecting the iron, of the furnace, of the bellows, I can believe it on that. Okay. Um, they also had the names of the metal workers, the people in the past, the, the blacksmiths, how the ore was transported from, from the hill down to the furnaces. Um, in contrast, just to check, we asked about ceramics, pottery, you know, we can find that all the time. No knowledge, really. They knew the word for clay and they knew the word for a terracotta pot. I'll give you those translations if you want after. Um, so we started asking some, some, some questions in our conversation piece. Um, do you know how iron was produced in the traditional way? I said, yes, there were blacksmiths, they built fires and used stone anvils and a hammer to make axes, hoes and machetes. How did they collect the iron? They made holes in the forest on Mount Lukumu. Could the iron have been made by Europeans? No, no, no. The iron was made by our great-grandparents. How was the iron made by our ancestors? They made Nzundru from the iron. They extracted from the soil. That's the, 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 the iron that they made. They built a fire and used bellows, which blew air to start the fire. Then charcoal was put into the hole, and then the iron ore was added. But none of them do this anymore, yeah? It's all kind of their, their oral history. Then they started bringing out their ancestral relics, stuff that they have retained in their heritage, as part of their heritage. This guy's got some nice votive weaponry. That's, this, is, this is used, um, or was used, they were saying, uh, as, as dowries for when people got married. So depending on the, and this is how they express it, the beauty of the lady, you, are, you, either, you either got one or five, you know, so, okay. We went we on a couple of questions. Uh, how, 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 long ago, uh, sorry, how long did it take to produce the iron? Um, it may have taken a whole day through to the night time to produce a machete. Which family made the iron? Was there a particular family? I said, yes, they were the Siongoi. Um, was it men? You know, just asking. Was it men who did this work? Yes, only men. Um, how long ago did the people make the iron? They'd been dead a long time, I imagine, said one guy. Given the age I am now, it was a long, long time ago. So here's some of the other stuff that they brought out. A uh, nice uh, iron cooking pot. And this odd object here. Um, 
So, conversations about iron continue. Is there anything you can tell me about this object? So they, they said, well, it was used in the forge to make the iron objects, such as machetes and hose. It basically, it's a handheld an anvil. They're, they're using like a, a hammer. Um, do you know the name of the place where they made the iron? They said, yeah, it was called Mipundi. Mipundi. <coughs> Kept coming up in conversation, Mipundi. Do you know where Mipundi is? No. It was close to Mount Lakumu, but we don't know where to find Mipundi. Da da! So we go looking for <laughs> Mipundi, yeah? So we're on Mount Lakumu now. We, that's where the iron is. It's basically, you can walk across and there's, the iron ore is just on the surface. You can pick it up. That's why, that's why this South African mining company aren't stupid. They, 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 they know where, where it's, it's there. But here we're looking, we're looking for. For the, for the site. It's a bit dramatic, that photograph. It doesn't, we're not, you're not using that as a vantage point to look for the site. We're going out, as you'd imagine, on, on survey. So we're, we're collect, that's me, um, collecting artifacts, uh, logging them with GPS, feeding the, feeding the data into a computer on a, on a night time. I'm just looking at the distribution and we keep, we keep going back to certain areas and expanding our surveys out. Finally, 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 we settle on one area. It's lowland area where there's loads and loads of stuff. It's slag, burnt areas, um, charcoal, even, even some um, iron objects being, worked iron, iron tools being found. So, talk, talk to the, 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 the company, the South African company. Like, we'd like to excavate some of this. And they said, that's great. Um, but we can't really afford you to bring out a team of archaeologists from the UK to go and do that work. So we said, well, okay, why don't we come up with a plan? Why don't we train right, some local guys, and not just like, any old local guys, the local guys whose ancestors were the founders of, 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 of this uh, Mipundi. Brilliant. So we put together a plan. I'm going to show you photographs that happened after this, but it took about six months to get this planning operation because we were just logistics. Doing the archaeological excavation in the middle of the forest, very, very difficult. But we trained 25 local villagers to become archaeologists for a month, and it was fantastic. Led by me, uh, Alice Hobson in the, in the UK, and then three, uh, our three guys from Central African Republic. First day, obviously, it's induction day, so they're all covered now in the garb of the mining company, head to toe. We didn't really need to wear hard hats, and you'll know, you won't see me in hard hat. Apologies for health and safety people in the room. Um, selection was the next stage, so we, we, we're agreeing where we're going to excavate, and we're explaining to them the reason why we're excavating here is because we can see this on the surface and we want to investigate. First task, clear the area. It's, as you can see, it's sort of already been cleared. You see that kind of vegetation clearance? That's by the mining company. Because they're, they're built, this is their lowland area where they're going to build their batch, basically their, their, their processing plant, the way down area. Did about 22 archaeological uh, site investigations, <coughs> trenches, small open area excavations. That's like one of the, uh, that's the police sta local police station on the on the on the, the left hand side, and the small one of the small villages just just to the north of that of that side there. That's the, that's only showing what the, how forested it was before that uh, vegetation was cleared back by the by the mining company. There's me looking very dramatic. Like, Ooh, you know. Here we are, uh, getting our tools, all our shiny tools, brought over from South Africa, the UK, all laid out very neatly. We're trying to explain to these guys, like, what on earth are we doing here? You know, they've had no idea what we were talking about at all. And uh, they're just like waiting for instructions. So, you know, so, I, so we're setting out, uh, this is like, how Alfred wanted to do it. Gridded system, you know, excavate little sondages, and we're trying to work out what's going on. So that's what we did. And these guys, off they go. Kind of, they did spend quite a lot of time just sitting around, kind of wondering what the other guys were doing. But eventually they got, they got, they got the idea. Trowels, they love trowels, these things, objects of interest, you know, pointy things. This guy's got a particularly large one in his hands that you can see there. And uh, off we go, um, start doing our, our excavation. We're also learning uh, techniques with, with the guys with regard to using scale, measuring. So this, this guy here is Guy, he's from Central African Republic. He's, uh, I've demonstrated to him, he's not done this before, I've demonstrated to him how to draw using a planning frame and all of these guys are looking whilst uh, he's explaining to them what he's doing. And so they, they're basically getting an understanding about why, what, what archaeology is all about. And 
But most importantly, it was about share, it was about sharing knowledge. It, um, they were had a, a a real desire to learn English. They wanted to learn English all the time. So lunch times were spent uh, just learning the thank you, Liz, but learning uh, particularly rude words, um, <laughs> phrases. You can imagine you kind of how you chat up girls and that kind of thing. When we explained to the guy in the green T-shirt what he actually said on his on his T-shirt, he thought it's brilliant. He had no idea. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I'm married to an Irish woman, so it's fun. Uh, and um, but 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 the other uh, it was about um, teaching them skills. One of these none of these guys have gone to school, so there's no schooling. So basic mathematics, adding up, taking away. Um, it was all to do with scale. I thought in the end when I put this put this presentation together, it's all about scale. Drawing, it's all about sections and plans, it's all about scale. Photography, scale bars. Measuring, it's all about, you know, to, to, to tell somebody to set out four metres by four metres to you and me might be dead easy. Them, what is a metre? What is four? How do, you know, and so doing this and doing it at right angle, what's a right angle? So, so all of this was just coming out and out and out. For, so for, for a month they were getting English, they were getting maths, they were getting archaeology, yeah? Um, and then more challenging concepts, uh, scrutiny. You know, like you, those people that work with volunteers, well, it's this, is it? Archaeology? No, it probably is stone, so you just kind of throw it away. <laughs> All of that was happening. So, but, but why, why is that natural and that man made? How can you tell? How do you know? So, we would, it's in, in infusing them to understand that there's differences between uh, man made stuff and that stuff. And then stratigraphy. That was a bit too complex, really, but kind of understanding kind of things, deposit and. Sorry, I'm now going to have to refer to my notes because I've got something to tell you. So, because uh, you might be interested in what we found. So, um, what we found, <laughs> we found, uh, in effect, dumps of flue pipes. So these are, in French, they're known as truyères, if I pronounce that right. Um, that was mixed with furnace waste slag, and it illustrated different stages of, of iron refinement. In French, slag, iron slag, we've just got iron um, I'm, I'm sure uh, metallurgists might be able to tell me that there are different types. Well, in French, there's like 15 different words for different types of slag beyond me, I'm, uh, but the pipes that, that are there were most likely made from local clays that had been found in, uh, from, in nearby riverbanks, fashioned around maybe a straight log, cut and fashioned into size. They were, but they were telling us this, they were saying how we would make this, would, would, we would go here, and they would take us to the riverbank, we would dig that clay, and then how would you, but how would you make, oh, we get a straight log, and they'd show us how to do it. Furnaces uh, were found, I never got really much in the way of, Photographs, but it's just because they're just kind of dark holes. But um, simple depressions in the ground, they were filled with charcoal. The iron ore was then uh, put in, it was then lit. The pipes provided the supply of air, it was inserted at an angle. Um, and most likely the furnaces were used time and time again, raked out each firing, and the unusable pipes, or the broken ones and slag, were basically depo deposited around. And that's like what you're seeing there it's a dump of, 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 of furnace. Um, water would have been a key ingredient, so we've got a nearby stream. We've got the Iron Hill Mipundi in the background, that's where I was taking a photograph of Dee looking out with his binoculars up there. Um, fines, uh, we've got loads of fines, not, not that many, but you know, quite a few. What of iron objects, uh, spears, uh, tools, uh, but also some jewellery. So we've got some beads and we've got some copper, uh, copper tips of earrings, copper, nearest source about 700 kilometers away. So there's trading going on between these people and uh, the, the Atlantic coast. Um, but then we got into radiocarbon dating. So last couple of, couple of minutes, Luke. Um, uh, so we discussed with them about how we could actually date some of the deposits. So we walked around and we agreed with the community what we were going to date and why we were going to date it. And they, were, they wanted to know the results. So you know, kind of radiocarbon data can take some time. So we had to entrust them to entrust us to go away, do this work, and then come and then report back. We didn't go back, we reported back to them. Um, so the radiocarbon dating that we did agreed, uh, sorry, the, the samples were quite, uh, iron commenced around 1400 AD and lasted for about four and a half centuries uh, through to the mid 1800s. Uh, but we also did find pottery um, through carbon dating of the deposits in which that pottery was found. The, the, the site itself dates back as far back as the 5th century AD. That mid 1800s date from some of the samples um, is giving us that, I think, that, that temporal connection between them when talking about their great grandparents being the iron workers. This site was operational in the, 
in the, in, in the mid 1800s. Um, finally, uh, the plan is for the client to support the building of a local museum. It sounds a bit grand, but it's basically going to be a shed probably with uh, some of these artifacts um, that have been conserved. Wessex Archaeology did the conservation for us, freshly photographed and everything. So there'll be, there'll be a lot of display, maybe some selected uh, um, uh, artifacts telling the story of their own metallurgical ancestry and the community being the custodians of their own, of their own heritage. Thank you very much.